Right now on Morning News Now, a primary push in South Carolina. This morning, Nikki Haley looking to gain ground against Donald Trump in her home state's Republican primary. It's happening this weekend. Now, both candidates working to win over a key group of voters. But who has more support from black women? We have team coverage. Also this morning, more fallout over that controversial embryo ruling by the Alabama Supreme Court as fertility clinics abruptly stop treatments for couples who are hoping to conceive. Basically, everything is shut down. So even though these are apparently my children, um, I don't have access to them. How much money do you think you spent? It's close to $250,000. We will bring you the very latest on the decision that is leaving couples and clinics in limbo. Plus, a devastating diagnosis for Wendy Williams, the former talk show host and radio personality, now battling two serious medical conditions. What we're learning about her health from her team and her doctors. And cutting back at the bar. That's right, more young adults trading shots and beer for mocktails and mixers. More on how the so-called sober curious movement has grown. Hmm, interesting <laughs> yeah, stuff there. Definitely. Yeah, Sometimes there's peer pressure from adults. I know. Hopefully we'll get into that as well. I'm all for it. All right. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stephen Romo. I'm Vicki Wynn. Joe and Savannah are off this morning. We're going to begin in South Carolina, where voters are set to head to the polls tomorrow for the Republican presidential primary. Yeah, GOP frontrunner, former President Trump, is looking to brush off a challenge from his last remaining Republican rival, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. Haley has spent days leading up to this primary touring her home state, hoping to pull off an upset here at bef right before the primary. But polls have shown Trump with a large lead heading into Saturday. With a win tomorrow, the former president will inch even closer to a likely rematch against President Biden this November. We have a full team coverage this morning with NBC's Bree Jackson in Charleston. But we begin with NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. John, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. So. There was more than a week of early voting that came to an end just mm -hmm. on Thursday. So give us a lay of the land here. What's the state of both the Trump and Haley campaigns heading into the primary? Yeah, good morning. Uh, look, I think the easiest way to explain this is that Nikki Haley a few days ago uh, did a press conference and said that she was vowing to stay in the race after South Carolina through uh, Super Tuesday, which is uh, the first week of March. Um, you typically don't have to go out there and say that unless you're expecting uh, to lose this state. So I think, uh, you know, the Haley campaign expects to lose. Uh, the Trump campaign expects to win. I've spent a lot of time in South Carolina uh, during the course of this campaign. Uh, and what you find is that there are plenty of voters who like Nikki Haley enough, but this is really Trump country. It's a state that uh, he has been uh, dominant in, at certainly at the general election level, and he was dominant in uh, you know, uh, in 2016, when he first ran in a competitive primary, not much has changed. You know, Jonathan, here's the thing. Trump is looking to pad his delegate lead. He really hasn't been doing a whole lot of campaigning, frankly, in South Carolina. What does Nikki Haley need to do, even if she doesn't win this primary, which it seems like everyone expects she's going to lose? But how does she even remain competitive moving forward? She needs to upend the table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like someone's, <laughs> someone's sitting there with a game that's not going their way. They got throw it up in the air uh, see what she can do. I, I mean, the truth is uh, she can't win the Republican nomination without winning states. Mm -hmm. um, and right now there are not any states on the board uh, that she is uh, that she's leading in. There are not any states on the board where she says she can win. Mm. Um, it, she really needs, uh, you know, not just a little bit of a shakeup here, but a complete uh, reversal of, of what's been going on. John, let's talk about the RNC. Uh, the former president's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, who he has endorsed as co-chair of the Republican National Committee, uh, said this week she thinks GOP voters are interested in the RNC footing Trump's legal bills. What's your take on that? Any indication that that's the case? It's definitely true that GOP voters named Trump would like the <laughs> RNC to foot <laughs> Donald Trump's legal bills. Um, what is not clear is that other Republican donors want to uh, foot Trump's legal bill. So while it may be okay with the electorate that wants to see Donald Trump win broadly, uh, the RNC has had tremendous difficulty raising money. Donald Trump's campaign has had tremendous difficulty raising money. And part of that is that very wealthy donors do not want to give him money just to hand it to his lawyers. All right, Jonathan Allen giving us the giggles this morning. Thank you so much, John.
Well, South Carolina played a pivotal role in launching President Biden to victory in 2020. So there should be no surprise that campaigns are fighting for support from key demographics, including black women. NBC News correspondent Bree Jackson is in Charleston, where she sat down with some black women voters ahead of tomorrow's primary. Vicki Steven, across the country, black women are a key voting bloc. The same goes for here in South Carolina. I sat down with a group of women in Charleston to have an open conversation about the 2024 election. Charleston, South Carolina, known for its rich history, culture, picturesque streets, and politics. Just by a show of hands, who's excited for the 2024 election? <laughs> Excited. We gathered this group of black women voters ahead of the state's Republican presidential primary. Their backgrounds, ages, and political views vary, but we found many of the same issues drive them to the polls. Women's maternal health. Someone my age may not have the same rights in terms of reproductive health that a generation before me had. Also top of mind, crime, student loan debt, and state efforts to ban books. As an African-American literature professor, that is something that is very concerning. There are concerns about the overall political climate. It's divisiveness, it's opposition, it's social issues being politicized. Despite dividing his time between the courtroom and the campaign trail, former President Trump leads the state's former governor, Nikki Haley, by double digits. I am more so dismayed with the fact that in the year 2024, we would even consider someone who is under indictment. At 81 years old, President Biden also faces challenges. His age is a, is a huge barrier. Black women, a key voting bloc, but far from a monolith. Each one here voicing their own views. Table discussions like this where we are comfortable and able to speak in layman's terms to bring up issues to, to, to get a little bit messy around the topics. A conversation turning to action this election cycle. We got to vote. We have to vote. And tonight, former President Trump is scheduled to be the keynote speaker at the Black Conservative Federation Gala in Columbia, South Carolina. In Charleston, South Carolina, Bree Jackson, Stephen, Vicki, back to you. All right, Bree, thanks so much. And we will have full coverage of the South Carolina Republican primary led by our colleague, Hallie Jackson. It gets underway tomorrow night at 6 Eastern, 3 Pacific, right here on NBC News Now. Well, this morning, former President Donald Trump is pushing to get the classified documents case against him thrown out. In four separate motions, the former president's legal team argued in papers filed in federal court in Florida the case should be dismissed, citing presidential immunity. This all happening despite a federal appeals court rejecting that argument earlier this month. The motions also argue that Trump should have been able to keep the documents that were in question even after he was president because of the Presidential Records Act. Now, you might remember Trump pleaded not guilty to 37 criminal counts related to his handling of the classified materials last June. Meanwhile, in New York, the judge who presided over the civil fraud case against Trump and his company rejected his attorney's request to delay payment of the $350 million judgment plus interest against them. Well, Trump is expected to appeal that ruling, but would have to post a bond first of the full amount of the damages before he actually does that. This morning, more clinics are pausing IVF treatments in Alabama following a court decision that ruled fertilized frozen embryos are considered people. It is causing concern among patients. It's forcing some to leave the state. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the very latest. IVF patients in Alabama devastated, furious and scrambling as more fertility clinics abruptly stop IVF procedures. Gabby Goydell has spent $20,000 on fertility treatments. Three miscarriages later, she's hoping to create embryos with her husband, Spencer, as soon as possible. I'll take my six rounds of shots tonight. But her clinic, Alabama Fertility, informed her it was putting all new IVF treatments on hold. I just broke down into tears. I really was inconsolable. We just started calling every clinic that we could think of. I'm not stopping this cycle. I've already been through too many shots, already invested too much time and energy. So she's packed her bags, jumping on a plane to Texas. 
now scheduled to complete her fertility treatment at a different clinic there. While Megan Cole and her husband Walker received word that the embryo transfer scheduled for her surrogate this Friday couldn't move forward. It was just completely crushing. So Now she says the clinic won't release their seven frozen embryos for use elsewhere. We are not allowed to um, transport them out of Alabama right now. Basically everything is shut down. So even though these are apparently my children, um, I don't have access to them. How much money do you think you spent? It's close to $250,000. IVF now accounts for roughly 2% of births in the U.S., but the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling creating legal liability for destroying embryos in the state has left the medical community in limbo. One of the worst things is how many questions it leaves unanswered. Leaving clinics with a difficult decision. Mobile Infirmary says it has no choice but to pause all IVF, while Fertility Institute of North Alabama says we're still going to perform IVF as we always have. Please do not panic. Mm. Our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker, who issued this ruling, has voiced his support for a philosophy that calls on evangelical Christians to reshape society based on their interpretation of the Bible. In an online broadcast, Parker says conservative Christians are meant to rule over key areas of American life, including education, government, and media. Well, this Alabama decision is once again putting a spotlight on reproductive rights ahead of this year's election. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns has more on the political impact of the court's ruling. In the wake of the Alabama Supreme Court decision ruling that embryos are children and really impacting IVF care in that state, reproductive rights have once again been thrust into the political spotlight, with some Republicans managing their messaging on the issue and some Democrats using it to rally voters. The fallout from the Alabama Supreme Court decision extending to politics, with some Republicans attempting to walk a fine line on reproductive rights. On Wednesday, Nikki Haley asked about the Alabama decision by NBC News's Ali Vitale. The Supreme Court there said that embryos created through IVF are considered children and are offered those same protections. Do you agree? I mean, I think, I mean, embryos to me are babies. Later, appearing to walk back those comments. I guess my question is, you then disagree with the Alabama Supreme Court, right? Yeah, I, but I think that the court was doing it based on the law. We don't want fertility treatments to shut down. Reproductive rights have become a thorny issue for Republicans since the fall of Roe v. Wade. With the vast majority of Americans supporting access to IVF, a survey from Republican stalwart Kellyanne Conway's firm showed 78% support even among those who identify as pro-life advocates. CPAC, an annual gathering of conservatives, women we spoke to were in full support of IVF. Why would they stop doing that for people that are having difficulties becoming pregnant? That's disturbing to me. And I'm, I'm no abortion, I'm pro-life. Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville also reacting. Do you agree with the Supreme Court decision or not? I'd have to look at what they're agreeing to and not agreeing to. I haven't seen that. Democrats, meanwhile, seizing on fears about the future of reproductive rights. President Biden posting to X, make no mistake, this is a direct result of Donald Trump ending Roe v. Wade. On the one hand, the proponents are saying that an individual doesn't have a right to end an unwanted pregnancy. And on the other hand, the individual does not have a right to start a family. Now, former President Trump has not yet weighed in on the issue, but on the campaign trail, he does repeatedly tout that he was responsible for overturning Roe versus Wade, while at the same time claiming that he wants to find consensus on the issue of abortion and reproductive freedom. Well, wow, so much fallout there, Dasha. Thank you. Well, we are learning new details this morning about what possibly caused that massive AT&T outage impacting tens of thousands of customers. The carrier says the disruption was likely caused by a process error, not a cyber attack. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more on just what happened. AT&T, one of the largest wireless carriers in the country, going down for some customers, unable to send or receive any calls or texts. As soon as I woke up this morning, it was gone. The outage lasting for hours. Didn't have any service. I need to make some phone calls. The company saying wireless service is now fully restored, but the FBI and Department of Homeland Security are investigating. The bureau saying should we learn of any malicious activity, we will respond accordingly.
I think a lot of people right now are asking, how does something like this happen? Unfortunately, the technologies that we use are becoming increasingly complicated. And this highlights the dependencies we have on very complex systems. Some emergency departments urging people not to call 911 unnecessarily. Massachusetts State Police saying they were flooded with calls that clogged their system as people tried to test their phones. Lexington 911, where's your emergency? This Kentucky 911 dispatch center had normal call volume, but says the outage is a good reminder to have alternate modes of communication. It's not a bad idea to have a landline, uh, a landline available. The outage impacting people from coast to coast. My messages weren't sending like I wasn't getting anything. Today's my birthday, so I want to call my mom and stuff. In Los Angeles, Uber driver Time Johnson feeling a difference during the morning commute. What have you noticed? It's just been really, really slow. So I'm thinking it may be the outages because people can't order right. their Ubers. Security experts saying the situation reveals potential vulnerabilities. I think it does show, though, that we need to really be thoughtful about, as we adopt these technologies, as we become dependent upon them, that there are fail-safes, that there are rollovers. A stark reminder as our reliance on technology only grows. Our thanks to Liz Kreutz for that report. Several federal agencies, including the FCC, are working with AT&T to learn more about what happened. But gosh, it just shows you yeah. how dependent we are totally. on our Wi-Fi networks. Yeah, I had a little bit of a break from my phone, yeah. so I can see the good side, but not being able to call people on a birthday. Oh, for sure. If you work and yeah. depend on that, like those drivers. Wow. Yeah, we are at the mercy of that technology. Yeah. Well, we're also at the mercy of Mother Nature. <laughs> the East Coast is set to get more wet weather. For more on that system and how it may affect our weekend, let's get your morning news now for Forecast. Hi there, guys. Yeah. Good hey, morning. Angie. Good morning to you guys. We finally made it to Friday. We've got a little bit of a rain out there. Uh, stretched up and down the East Coast, really. That's the pinpoint of where we're going to see the slick, kind of soggy conditions for our early morning commute. The rest of the country honestly looks great. So let's focus on what's going on from the Mid-Atlantic to the Southeast and up into the northern portions uh, of New England. That's where we do see a bit of a wintry mix. We see some rain stretched across places like Boston, Hartford. The farther north you go up into New England, though, it is falling as snow. So we will see a Again, a little bit of a difficulty when it comes to that morning commute, but that's really it. This system's going to push out of here pretty quick, and we'll see the snow, the rain start to clear the mid-Atlantic and the northeast coast here as we get into the second half of the day. But if you're headed out maybe in the next hour or so, the umbrella likely is going to be needed. A couple of afternoon thunderstorms possible across parts of the southeast. So heads up there, it'll mainly be portions closer to the coast, uh, but we could see some of those stronger storms developing. One thing is we likely will still see some lake effect snow happening uh, even as we go into the evening hours downwind of those lakes but um, nothing really all that impressive when it comes to accumulation snow wise rain wise not all that impressive either but it will give us a good uh, dose of some some showers from charleston to norfolk we could see maybe a quarter of an inch up to a half of an inch really just kind of that pesky rain that interrupts our early morning commute big picture look as we roll into the weekend i like i said really kind of nice conditions across the country no real big major storm systems that are going to interrupt travel or plans, especially outdoor plans uh, for folks that live in the south. The one thing you'll have to make sure that you note, temperatures are going to be quite warm for this time of year. We've got upper 70s in southern portions of Texas as we head into your Saturday. The middle of the country, places like Kansas City are expected to head to the low 60s. That, of course, not the typical temperature for February, but that's where we're going to be. Even as far north as the plains, uh, the northern plains, I should say, we'll see plenty of sunshine and temperatures in the 50s, 60s, running 10 to 15, even close to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. California, good news for you. Sunny, dry for your Saturday. You'll continue to dry out here. Uh, and the only spot that we'll watch is a little bit of some chilly conditions across parts of the Northeast as that cool wind starts to usher in. It's going to be a really pleasant day, though. By Sunday, we'll still be dealing with the near record temperatures across the middle of the country. And then, unfortunately, we're going to gear up for another storm system out west. Now, Sunday, mainly for the Pacific Northwest, that's where we'll see a little more snow, a little more rain. But by the time we get into late Late Sunday and into Monday, we're watching another system, a developing uh, low that will move closer to California. This is Sunday evening, so by the time you get out the door early into uh, into Monday morning, you could be once again dealing with some rain across California. One thing to note, this doesn't look quite as strong as the last systems, but it will bring some more rain to folks in Southern California who have had a, a slew of problems from this really soggy kind of winter uh, season that we've, we've been dealing with for months. 
LA likely will hit their um, their wettest February on record. We've got about an inch of rain to pick up in in you know the next couple of days in order for that to happen. But we'll also see some additional snow guys across parts of the Cascades, the Sierra, and the Rockies. So uh, picking up some snow, picking up some rain, and I know that's not what folks want to hear, of course, out in California. But we've got some sunshine to deal with between now and then uh, for folks there. Yeah, we love the Friday, Saturday, and it's a little turn on Sunday, it but we'll did. take it. It always yeah. does. Monday, yeah. come on. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Mondays. Get with the program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Andrew Aspen, thanks so much. Of course. And a lot more to come on Morning News Now. Later this hour, one giant leap for American space exploration. More on the first U.S. moon landing in more than five decades. Plus, new this morning, a new set of sanctions by the U.S. against Russia as we mark two years of the war in Ukraine. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Maybe hard to believe, but tomorrow marks two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. The resulting war has killed tens of thousands of people and destroyed many cities and villages. In anticipation of this big milestone, the United States is unveiling a new package of Russian sanctions on more than 500 targets. NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist joins us now for more on this. Aaron, good to see you. So what can we expect from this latest round of sanctions? And do we know about who or what these targets are? Well, Stephen, we're getting a little more detail this morning. President Biden just put out a statement in the last hour. As you said, they're looking at more than 500 different sanctions, different targets as a part of this particular action that we'll see taken by both the Treasury Department and the State Department. This is the single largest group of uh, sanctions that the U.S. has taken against Russia since its invasion of Ukraine. And the president in his statement said today that it is because of the war in Ukraine that we're seeing these sanctions and because of the death of Alexei Navalny in a Russian prison. And this particular group, as we understand it from the president of sanctions, will target uh, individuals who are connected to Alexei Navalny's uh, imprisonment, as well as individuals who are connected to Russia's financial sector, to its defense industrial base, as well as other people uh, on multiple continents, according to the president's statement. And the secretary, deputy secretary of Treasury, spoke about this package and how it's going to be even bigger than what the U.S. is doing. He talked to Reuters earlier. Listen to that. You should expect to see sanctions and actions taken by countries that are part of our coalition as well that are focused on accomplishing our two goals, making sure that Russia can't get access to the goods they need to build the weapons that they want, and also taking responsibility for slowing down Russia's access to the revenue, revenues they need to prop up their economy, but also to build the weapons that they want going forward. These sanctions will be targeted at the military industrialized complex in Russia, but also in third countries, those companies that help facilitate Russia's access to the goods that they want. And Stephen, we've also seen from the president's statement that the action taken today will also include export restrictions on 100 different entities uh, that the president says has, have been providing backdoor support to Russia. And so we'll be looking today to learn more about what exactly that will be. Well, 500 additional targets. We know there have already been a lot of targets, a lot of sanctions in Russia. So some may ask, how have we not already sanctioned them to the max? Aaron, how much do you think these, these new measures will actually affect the war and President Putin? So the Treasury Department has said that the sanctions that we've seen so far have had an effect. It is, they've impacted the Russian economy as well as the Russian military's ability to, uh, to create, to build weapons and uh, tanks and things of that nature. Uh, but obviously there's more that can be done. And we also know that in this group of sanctions we'll see today, uh, it will include uh, actions to be taken against sanctions evaders people who've been able to somehow get around some of these sanctions, potentially inside Russia, people inside Russia, and people outside Russia. So it's a question, Stephen, I think that's a good one to ask and one that we'll be digging into as, the, as we learn more about what exactly is in this package and how it's different from previous packages. Certainly, more to come on that. Aaron Gilchrist, thanks so much. Turning now to the ongoing war in Gaza this morning, Israel is coming to continue its push for a new deal to free the Israeli hostages that are still being held by Hamas in Gaza. Now, one woman who was released after being held in the tunnels of Gaza is speaking exclusively to NBC News. Avi Va Siegel is opening up about her 51 days of hell, as she calls it, and her fight to free her American husband, who is still in captivity. We do want to warn you, she also talks about sexual violence. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from Jerusalem with more on this. Uh, Molly, it is good to see you. Tell us more about what Aviva had to say. 
Vicky, good to be with you. We sat down with Aviva Siegel and actually Keith, which is her husband's brother, Lee Siegel, yesterday for a wide-ranging interview. Since she was released in November, she has been working relentlessly to advocate for her husband. And she says the Israeli government is not doing enough. Take a listen. U.S. Middle East envoy Brett McGurk is in Israel meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Also meeting with American families of hostages still being held captive by Hamas in Gaza including released hostage Aviva Siegel, growing increasingly frustrated her American husband Keith has not returned. Now speaking exclusively with NBC News alongside Keith's older brother Lee. I think that Netanyahu has forgotten about Keith and forgotten to be human and bring the human people back. His priorities seem to be military and political survival. What he needs to understand is his survival depends on getting Keith and all the other hostages home alive. Aviva and Keith were held together for most of her 51 days in captivity. Moved 13 times, always held by armed gunmen, she says, and never had enough food or water. Since returning, she's testified about sexual violence in front of the Knesset, sharing this story with us. She came and she looked at me and she said, he touched me. And that was a moment that I'll never, ever forget. And I'm worried about them, that they'll come back pregnant and it'll be too late. Too late because they will be too far along in their yeah, pregnancies. that they'll be too long in their pregnancy. To terminate. Yeah. They were held below ground in dark tunnels with little air. The last time she saw Keith was the night before her release. I bent down to him, I hugged him, and I said, you be strong for me, I'll be strong for you, not knowing if they're going to separate us and we'll never see each other again. On November 26th, seen here in video from Hamas's militant wing, the 62-year-old South African Israeli says huge crowds mobbed the cars. I was sure that it would be my last minutes of my life. The only minute that I knew that I was going to Israel is when I met the first soldier. Finally, back in Israel, she's seen on the bus smiling, waving. Is there a happy memory that you think of? Is there a happy moment from before October 7th that kind of is Keith to you? You know, it'll sound a little bit strange, but I try not to think about those happy moments because I break up into tears. And it's too difficult for me to think about the happy moments. And that's how I protect myself. <laughs> Aviva hasn't been back to her home in Kibbutz Kafar Aza in southern Israel, wearing this necklace every day. I do know that I went through a lot of things and that they are sitting here in my heart. I know that it's hard for me to sleep, that I wake up like with sort of nightmares or whatever. So I'm still in Gaza. She was incredibly brave, incredibly strong, speaking to us. Now, of course, she wants her husband back immediately. And it is no surprise that her and other hostage families are very frustrated. We also have learned from an Israeli official today that an Israeli delegation is going to a new round of negotiations in Paris. And Vicky, this is really a core demand of the hostage families, that at least the Israeli delegations show up at the table. Vicky. Uh, Molly, what an incredible conversation and what she said actually about the potential victims of sexual violence and the other additional layers that come with that trauma. We really appreciate you bringing that candid conversation to us. Molly Hunter, thank you so much. Well, coming up, a heartbreaking update for you on the health of former talk show host Wendy Williams. What we are now learning about the two conditions she has been diagnosed with. Hmm, and uh, turning dry January into a year-round thing. We'll tell you about the trend that has more young people cutting back on alcohol. Morning News Now, we'll be right back. We're back now with an update on former talk show host Wendy Williams' ongoing health battles. Williams' team says she has been diagnosed with primary progressive aphasia and frontotemporal dementia. These are conditions associated with changes in behavior, communication, and personality. 
Now, if this sounds familiar, it may be because back in 2022, actor Bruce Willis was diagnosed with aphasia, which has progressed to frontotemporal dementia. The announcement comes just days before the premiere of a lifetime documentary about Williams' physical and mental health that is set to air this weekend. For more on this, we want to bring in Dr. Romy Mushtaq. She's the neurologist and chief wellness officer at Great Wolf Resorts. Dr. Mushtaq, thanks for being with us. She's also the author of the book, The Busy Brain Cure, the eight-week plan to find focus, tame anxiety, and sleep again. Dr. Mushtaq, let's talk uh, first about just this condition in general. What are mm -hmm. some of the symptoms? And, you know, Wendy is only 59 years old. Bruce Willis was young as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a typical age of diagnosis? Vicki, good morning. And I a heartfelt con uh, condolences out to Wendy, her loved ones, and all of her fans. Frontotemporal dementia is a form of dementia that typically happens at a younger age. Average age of diagnosis is around 45 to 65. And it's an actual group of different types of dementia. One type can affect personality. And the type that they're saying Wendy has can affect speech, known as frontotemporal dementia with primary progressive aphasia. Right there, you can see it can affect both the frontal lobe of the brain right at the front behind mm -hmm. your forehead and the temporal lobe behind the ears as we're seeing on the brain scans here. Dr. Mushtaq, how is this disease typically diagnosed and, and how does it progress? Yeah, it's not an easy diagnosis and it can take time. Sometimes the first symptoms are behavioral changes or difficulty speaking. So it's a careful clinical history. In some, there may be a family history. It is not clear with Wendy and a genetic variant as well. How it's diagnosed is by a neurologist specializing in memory with a careful physical exam as well as an MRI of the brain and additional type of imaging known as SPECT imaging that can show how glucose and other tracers are taken up in the frontal and temporal regions of the brain. So it often can take a long time to diagnose and can be a diagnosis of exclusion, which is mm. not easy. And doctor, what happens next? How is this treated? How does mm. someone like Wendy move forward? Sadly, Vicki, there is no actual cure for frontotemporal dementia or primary progressive aphasia. Supportive care mm -hmm. is what's needed. There, it's very common to have behavioral outbursts or mood, and there are psychiatric medications for that. Speech pathology and language pathology can help with, uh, you know, prolonging the ability to use language. But the most important thing is that skilled nursing care is oh. given to caregivers because it can be very difficult to watch a loved one so young suffer. Yeah, our best thoughts are with Wendy, her family, and her caregivers. Dr. Romy Mushtaq, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Vicki. To more health news this morning, we've been reporting on a trend that we're seeing in younger generations to cut back on drinking. It's the so-called sober curious movement. Well, NBC News Now anchors and Clay Assemois went to a sober curious pop-up to see what it's all about, and she gives us a look. Sweeping declaration, I am never getting drunk again <laughs> as long as I live. Today, more young people are rethinking their alcohol consumption. 62% of adults under 35 say they drink. That's down from 72% two decades ago. How many of you consider yourselves sober curious? A couple of months ago, I stopped drinking alcohol. Uh, and one of the things that's really helped me is um, the range of no and low alcohol drinks that are available. The movement has many terms, like no low beverages and sober curious. Put simply, it's all about people who are curious about sobriety. Quick history lesson. From 1920 to 1933, the U.S. restricted the production, import, transport, and sale of alcohol, the Prohibition era. But as long as people have been freely drinking in the U.S., they've also been trying to stop. The term sober curious popping up around 2018 after being coined by author Ruby Warrington. There was a very binary attitude to alcohol addiction, I suppose. You were either an alcoholic and therefore you had to stop, or you were a normal drinker. What the Sober Curious movement has shone a light on is actually you don't have to have a drinking problem for drinking to be a problem for you. The shift seen in booze-free bars and groups like Absence of Proof, which host pop-up gatherings around New York. The rise of sober curiosity coming along with new trends, like Dry January, beginning as a public health campaign back in 2013. Just last month, a quarter of Americans participating for the new year.
with global sales of no and low alcohol products reaching more than $13 billion last year. It's no longer for those who are really kind of out on the fringe of trying new things. It's a mainstream product. Marcus Seiki founded Ritual Zero Proof, a non-alcoholic spirits company, one of many now on the market. A critique of Zero Proof liquors or mocktails has often been, this is just glorified water or expensive soda. I think with the rise of non-alcoholic spirits, you can have that same complexity that you would have with a regular cocktail, but none of the, the negative effects of alcohol. Sober curious communities hoping to normalize the benefits of booze-free living. I think when I first removed alcohol, I thought about it as a loss. You know, I'm, I'm losing something fun in my life. And when I reframe that to think about all the things that I was gaining rather than losing by taking alcohol away, my time, my energy, my mental health, it made it way more exciting. It really is a, a net positive rather than a loss. And our thanks to Zinclair Asimois for that report. If the sober curious is a concept that interests you, experts say you don't have to give up alcohol completely, but that you should commit to trying it for at least three months. It may also help to tell your friends ahead of time to avoid that peer pressure we so That's often That's the thing. Yeah. It's just making sure everyone around you is also on board, right? right and yeah. helping to support you. And, you know, more power to you, folks. People feel a little weird if someone says, I don't want to drink. They right. feel a little judged. Tell them it's not about you. Just giving it a try. I love it. Great advice. Give it, give it try. Well, coming up, extra charge. New numbers shedding light on just how much credit card companies are profiting off mm -hmm. your debt. We'll break down a new report and what it means for your wallet. Plus, over the moon, history in space as the U.S. makes its first lunar landing in more than 50 years. Did you watch it last night? We're going to show you if you missed it. You're watching Morning News Now. Hey there, we're back now with new government data highlighting credit card companies and just how much money they've made. And it's a lot. According to a report from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, companies are hiking rates to record highs in order to pad profits. For more on this, let's bring in Investopedia Editor-in-Chief Caleb Silver. Caleb, good morning to you. Thanks for being here. So the average credit card APR has almost doubled to nearly 23 percent, bringing rates to their highest level since the Federal Reserve ever even started collecting this data. So walk us through the highlights of this new report. Yeah, this is from the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau looking at those excess credit card net interest margins. Now, credit cards make their money by loaning out money at a pretty high rate. And those rates, those APRs are at an all time high. So that's doubled in the last 10 years as credit card companies have hiked those APRs much higher than what we call the prime rate. The prime rate is something set by the Federal Reserve. That's where all bank loans, credit card rates, car loans, mortgages are set from. Credit card companies have been hiking those up aggressively, and it's costing consumers and credit card holders an about $25 billion extra a year, according to the CFPB. Wow, $25 billion extra in interest. Uh, Caleb, you mentioned how the rates are determined. We obviously see inflation going up. What can we as consumers do to try to lower them on our individual credit cards? Can we negotiate? Yeah, you can absolutely negotiate, especially if you have good credit. Now, your APR is partially set by the credit card you're getting from the issuer, but also on your credit rating. If you have a low credit rating, you're going to get a high APR. But if your credit rating is good, call up your credit card company mm. and say, hey, I deserve a lower APR or break up with your credit card company. Mm. If you have to, there's plenty of credit card companies that would love to have you or consolidate to a lower interest loan for the meantime, pay it all off. So you're not getting these revolving charges. These revolving charges really hurt your credit score and they pad the price profits of these credit card companies wow. that are doing fabulously well right now. Interesting yeah. A negotiation. Yeah. I like that. Well, according to Experian, one of the major credit bureaus, the average credit card balance last year was about $6,500. So what advice do you have for people who are trying to combat those high interest rates and who are working to lower that debt? Yeah, hit that high interest credit card debt first because okay. that's mm. the one that's ending up ending up costing you month after month. That $100 sweater is now $150 mm -hmm. if you don't pay it off. Pay those first. Pay down the big chunks first, especially the high interest stuff, and then take care of the lower interest uh, borrowings you might have. Those are where you're going to start to pick up some momentum. But do not sit around with high interest credit card debt revolving month after month. That hurts your credit score, and you are ended up paying more for what you ended up buying in the first place. Caleb, we got to ask you about the news of this week, right? Capital One is now acquiring Discover Financial for more than $35 billion. So if this merger is approved by regulators, what does that mean for consumers and interest rates for folks who are cardholders? 
Yeah, this is just, if approved, this just makes one, another, another massive credit card company, and it gives consumers less leverage and less shopping power mm. to find a lower rate. So think about cereal uh, boxes on the shelf, mostly owned by two companies. They set the pricing power. Yeah. Same thing in the credit card industry, less room for consumers to negotiate and get a better deal if you have only four major credit card companies if this goes through. Wow. Hmm. I was thinking one less login for a credit card company. But <laughs> yeah, less competition there, too. Yeah, that's one way of the downside. At it. All right, Caleb Silver, thanks so much. Well, more financial headlines now. Several pharmacies nationwide are reporting problems filling prescriptions. Yeah, CBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other news. Good morning, Silvana. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, Vicky. Yes, yeah, so pharmacies across the country are experiencing disruptions. This is following a hack at United Health's technology unit, which is Change Healthcare. Now, United Health says the problems began Wednesday after a suspected nation state actor gained access to Change Health's network. Change says it took action to disconnect the system to prevent further impact. CVS says the hack means in certain cases it's been unable to process insurance claims. Walgreens says a small number of prescriptions may be affected, but it does have procedures in place to fill them with minimal delays. General Motors self-driving car unit Cruise is preparing to resume testing its robo-taxis on public roads with safety drivers behind the wheel. Reports say Houston and Dallas are potential locations with as few as 10 cars in each city and no passengers. Cruise suspended operations in October following an accident in San Francisco where one of its vehicles dragged a pedestrian who had been struck by another car. The Justice Department and SEC are are investigating that incident. And KFC is adding a new pizza inspired menu, inspired item to its menu. Now, you'll be able to get your hands on the pizza starting Monday for a limited time. It features two white meat fried chicken fillets <laughs> topped with marinara sauce, okay. melted mozzarella, and crispy pepperoni. KFC first debuted the oh. pizza in the Philippines in 2015, and it's made its way to South Korea, Taiwan, India, Thailand, Germany, and Mexico on its journey to restaurants here in the U.S. And if you can't wait until Monday, KFC will give out the pizza for three, for free today and tomorrow at a pop-up location wait, in New York City. Mm. For free? Wow. Uh -huh. I would pay to eat that. I mean, it's not a bad wait, idea. Is the crust chicken? Right. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> I think that's what it is. From so there's picture. no bread, there's no carbs. It's there's just, no bread. Oh, the pizza, the, the it's chicken, healthy. No the chicken bread. <laughs> is the bread. <laughs> that's what we're it's telling healthy. ourselves. It's very healthy. There Lots of protein, guys. <laughs> All right, Silvana now bringing us that late breaking information. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you, Silvana. You I'll see it. you at the uh, at KFC. There we go. See you there. <laughs> All right. Well, a Houston-based company is celebrating a major milestone in space exploration. Intuitive machines made history. They successfully completed the first U.S. moon landing in more than 50 years. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has the details. Leave it to a 14-foot robot named Odysseus to stick the first U.S. moon landing since Apollo. What we can confirm, without a doubt, as our equipment is on the surface of the moon. Houston-based Intuitive Machines, now the first private company to successfully land on the moon. Houston, Odysseus has found his new home. But now, troubleshooting a communications issue. And lift off. Go SpaceX, go IM-1, and the Odysseus lunar lander. Odysseus launched on a SpaceX rocket just seven days ago, sending back spectacular photos of Earth as it rocketed towards the lunar South Pole. On board, six NASA experiments. The ice water on the pole makes it NASA's target zone when astronauts return in just a few years. This is the South Pole of the Moon. That's correct. In a NASA simulator, we saw the hostile conditions they'll have to navigate, the sun hanging very low on the horizon. Those shadows are so long. To cut costs, NASA has hired 14 private companies to run advanced experiments on the moon, though many could fail. It's really, really difficult to land on the moon. I mean, there's no air or to slow you down so you can't use parachutes. The Odysseus lander will only have 12 to 13 days before its solar power runs out. Just getting there is mission accomplished. Tom Costello, NBC News.
up that will never cease to amaze right. me, right? A whole new space race. Yeah. Love it. Well, coming up, dancing through life. Yeah, a group of seniors uh, turning to dance to stay healthy, both in body and mind. So grab a partner and stay with us. This <laughs> is Morning News Now. Put on your dancing shoes. Some seniors in Cleveland are finding friendship and community through a weekly dance class that's helping them stay healthy mentally and physically. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has their inspiring story. Every Tuesday night, they fill the room, focusing on just one thing, learning a new line dance from teacher Linda Green. What do you see in the dancers' faces every week? I see whatever is bugging them or whatever they're worrying or thinking about, when they step through the door, they let it go. One, two, three, step back, half turn. It's a free class at the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Health Center in East Cleveland, part of the world famous Cleveland Clinic. Sheree Allen Tate rarely misses a week. She started coming after she retired eight years ago. Your body feels good, you just feel like you've exhaled, you feel really good. Sheila is one of the younger dancers, a beginner. She used to be the security guard here. I was here when they came and I was here when they left. So I said when I retire that I was going to come to line dancing classes. Uh, do it again. We go. Ready? She had lung cancer and when she started the class last fall, struggled to breathe. Yeah. Now that I come to line dance, it has helped me so much. I can dance a whole song now. <laughs> Cross, kick, cross, kick. But it's more than just the exercise, it's the bonds they form. Cross, it's a fellowship, I guess you could say. Someone might be missing a couple of weeks and we'll call or text and say, oh, is everything okay? We missed you. You know, we care about each other. They celebrate everyone's birthday with a dance party. Hattie Castleberry just turned 81. Just over a year ago, she fell and broke her pelvis. She called me from the hospital and wanted to know how I was doing. I said, no, how are you doing? And she said, I'll be back. I'll be back. Hattie was back after only four weeks. Not only do we dance, but we learn to love each other and care about each other. And that means a lot. It's like your special extended family, I say. The numbers right now of people who are lonely, they're really high. This seems like it's sort of an antidote to that. It's sort of helping people with loneliness. Oh yeah, most definitely helping people with loneliness because we connect when we come here. <laughs> their advice to everyone. Never too late to learn how to do different things, but just get out and you'll see. Put a smile on your face and keep stepping, keep it going. A family looking out for one another. Kate Snow, NBC News. Wow, what an adorable group. Kate Snow, thanks for that. And that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But your news continues right now. And good morning. Thanks for being here and happy Friday. I'm Stephen Romo in for Joe and Savannah today. Right now on Morning News Now, on hold, the growing fallout this morning surrounding that controversial IVF ruling in Alabama. More and more fertility clinics there are now pressing pause on treatments, and that is forcing some couples to look elsewhere for care. We've got the latest. Also this morning, thousands of AT&T customers are back online after a nationwide outage that left some Americans scrambling to make calls and send texts. So what went wrong? We've got an update from the company in just a moment. Plus, South Carolina's critical Republican primary is now just a day away, with the state's former governor, Nikki Haley, fighting to topple former President Trump's commanding lead in the polls. Her final push on her home turf to convince voters she's the right one for the White House. And we're going to end your work week with our can't miss list. The latest and greatest in the world of entertainment and that includes Netflix's live action revival of an animated cult classic, Avatar The Last Airbender. But does it stack up with its source material? The reviews are in. 
Some of them not so good, some of them pretty good. We'll break it all down for you. But we do begin this morning in Alabama with the growing impact of the state Supreme Court's ruling, which says frozen embryos are children without exception. Right now, several more fertility clinics in the state are suspending IVF treatments as lawmakers look for ways to protect patients and providers as well. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest details this morning. Growing frustration this morning across Alabama as more patients in the middle of fertility treatments are learning their doctors are holding off on IVF, worried they could get sued because of a controversial new court ruling. Some couples even making the difficult decision to leave the state. We found a clinic that will take us in Texas. After three miscarriages, Gabby Goydell says her doctors recommended she have her embryos genetically tested to boost her chances of a healthy pregnancy. I'm not stopping this cycle. I've already been through too many shots, already invested too much time and energy. But what happens to embryos found with genetic abnormalities? Typically, they're not implanted and usually discarded. Others found not viable after the thaw process. It's all got fertility clinics on edge after the Alabama Supreme Court found frozen embryos no different than children, potentially putting clinics on the hook legally for their survival. As soon as I saw the number pop up on my phone, I knew it wasn't going to be um, good news. After spending nearly $250,000 on fertility treatments and a surrogate, Megan and Walker Cole were devastated to learn their fertility clinic not only canceled their embryo implantation this week, but say their clinic would not give them their frozen embryos to use outside the state. So even though these are apparently my children, um, I don't have access to them. Meanwhile, Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker under scrutiny for invoking God in the court decision. This new reality in Alabama creating a politically perilous issue in an election year. I think it was a terrible ruling. Presidential hopeful Nikki Haley trying to clarify where she stands. We don't want fertility treatments to shut down. And our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke about the court's ruling, saying, quote, on the one hand, the proponents are saying that an individual doesn't have a right to end an unwanted pregnancy. And on the other hand, the individual does not have a right to start a family. Certainly more to come on this one. Meanwhile, an investigation is underway at the University of Georgia campus in Athens after a woman was found dead there yesterday. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is on the campus now with the latest. Good morning, Blaine. Uh, so what do we know about this? Well, Stephen, good morning to you. Investigators this morning are calling this an active investigation. They say they do believe that foul play was involved. Now, we're just learning that this student up until last year was actually a student at UGA. She was still active in the sorority here, and she had transferred to a nearby school. Now, meanwhile, here on campus today, classes are canceled for the day, and many students are living in fear and grieving. This morning at the University of Georgia, the quiet calm of a college campus is shattered, replaced with an active police investigation after officials found the body of a young woman on campus Thursday morning. This is a tragic day. Police say a concerned individual called 911 after her friend went out for a morning run near UGA and never returned. Officials began searching and found her within minutes in an area around Lake Herrick near the school's intramural fields. The individual was unconscious and not breathing and had visible injuries. Police have not released the victim's name, but overnight, the president of nearby Augusta University confirmed she was a student at the school's College of Nursing campus in Athens. In a letter to students, he expressed his deepest sorrow, writing, the receipt of this news was shocking to all of us. It's left students at both schools in fear. I'm worried about my safety. Like, it's just, it's really scary. It all comes just one day after another student died suddenly on the UGA campus, though officials say the two incidents are not linked. In a statement, the school acknowledges the difficult week, writing, it will uniquely test the resolve of our campus community, particularly our students. Now, as police search the area and comb through security footage for a suspect, they say there is no immediate danger to the public. Students are not so sure. I'm honestly not even considering walking by myself. I just don't want to take any chance at all. 
And to that point, Stephen, officials here are urging students to not travel alone, if at all possible, walk in a group or walk with friends if they're moving across campus. Now, the police chief here says that he can't remember a homicide on campus in the last 20 years. They're asking anybody with any information to call police. Stephen. Hmm, alarming stuff. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you. Well, this morning, we're learning more about what may have caused that cellular outage, which left tens of thousands of customers reporting problems for making calls and sending texts. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung joins us now with more on this. Brian, I was one of them. I'm an AT&T oh, no. customer. Oh, no. Could not send texts. It was a little nice for a while, but also <laughs> sort of felt like being in Little House on the Prairie. Yeah, you know, a lot of people were actually saying I actually enjoyed uh, right. being on uh, my cell phone, but it was regardless, uh, you know, a very serious issue. It left families unable to contact each other, businesses confused about how to open, and emergency services scrambling to offer alternative ways of contact. AT&T says its network is now back up and running for its over 241 million connected devices. And we're getting new details on what may have led to the issue. Just 24 hours ago, users on one of the country's largest mobile networks were left unable to make even basic calls or send texts for half a day. Is it the end of the world? And apparently the whole country doesn't have service. Like, what's going on? I want to talk to the CEO. I'm so dang on sick of y'all. AT&T now saying they believe the 12-hour issue, quote, was caused by the application and execution of an incorrect process used as we were expanding our network, not a cyber attack. The company added it is further investigating the matter. Several government agencies said they're taking a look, too, including Homeland Security, the Federal Communications Commission, and the FBI. Experts say most of the time, outages aren't malicious. The FBI is going to be looking for any sort of criminal activity. However, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, technical outages of this nature, whether it's with a power company, a telecommunications company, or even your bank, tend to be of a technical operational network. DownDetector.com showed issues beginning Thursday at 4 a.m. Hours later, the count on reported problems had surged to over 70,000 as users tried to troubleshoot their phones. That's the AT&T line that says emergency calls only and, uh, and there's no service. Emergency services advising people to use landlines or even call boxes as workarounds. Around 3 p.m. Thursday, AT&T announced it had restored wireless service to all of its affected customers. That was too late for Conchinia Fowler in Greenville, South Carolina, who had no choice but to close her restaurant, Vegan House Shack, for the day. Thursday is a big day for me. I lost a lot of money. She uses AT&T to take the 20% of orders that come by phone and also uses a hotspot to process the card terminal she needs to process sales. Now Fowler says she's done. Are you thinking this is crazy enough I might switch? Oh, it's definitely a switch. Switch is definitely going to take place. And by the way, a lot of phones were stuck yesterday on SOS mode. Your phone, when in SOS mode, can make an emergency call and ping your location to emergency services. On iPhones, they can also contact a loved one or family member designated as an emergency contact, which you have to set up. It's all a good reminder, Stephen, uh, that inf unfortunate situation from yesterday ever happens again. Hopefully not. Yeah, hopefully not, but uh, we'll see. So much dependence on technology. <laughs> yeah. We'll see how it goes. For sure. Thanks so much. Well, with just one day to go until the South Carolina Republican primary, all signs point to another big victory for Donald Trump. But his last remaining rival, Nikki Haley, has been sharpening her attacks on the GOP frontrunner. NBC's Garrett Haig is in at Charleston with more on this. Garrett, good morning to you. So there are some high stakes here for Haley. Hey, Stephen. Good morning. Yeah, absolutely high stakes. And we are in this final sprint now where South Carolina Republican voters are going to be forced to choose between their former governor and a former president who so far looks like he's ready to steamroll his way to another Republican nomination. Mayor J. Rowe, she has this morning, Nikki Haley running hard in her home state. This is the time South Carolina can really step up and show the direction that we want our country to go in. But she's also running out of time to catch frontrunner Donald Trump before Saturday's primary. All he's doing is talking about himself. And that's the problem, is it's not about him. It's about the American people. Recent polls have Haley trailing the former president by nearly 30 points but performing far better than Mr. Trump against President Biden in the general election this fall, a point she continues to pound home on the campaign trail. 
I defeat Joe Biden by 18 points in that Marquette poll. That's bigger than the presidency. That's House. That's Senate. That's governorships. That's everything. Mr. Trump dismissing Haley's candidacy in a radio interview. I don't care at this point if she stays in. She's getting very few votes. Overnight, lashing out at her at a Christian media convention. It looks like she's going to lose by 25 or 30 points. That's a lot. She's governor, but people don't like her too much, and she's hurting the party, but I don't care. Let her run. Voters like Yvonne Ramsey now left to choose between two candidates who've each never lost a race in South Carolina. When you put Nikki Haley's economic record up against Donald Trump's, what do you say? I don't think she did as much for South Carolina as Trump did, and especially in our Afro-American community. President Biden fundraising on the West Coast Thursday, contrasting his presidency with his once and likely future opponent, telling donors, quote, I'm not the gift of all presidents, but I'm sure as hell better than the last guy. Go. No rest for the wicked after South Carolina. The Michigan primary comes next on Tuesday. Then after that, the first nationwide test for these candidates. Super Tuesday the following week. More than a dozen contests all across the country from Texas to California to Vermont. Donald Trump leads in the polls in all of those states. Stephen? Well, all right. Garrett Haig, thanks so much for that update. All right, let's get a check with your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us. Hey, Angie. Hey, good morning, Stephen. We've got uh, really nice conditions for most of the country. A bit of rain to deal with along the East Coast. But let's start with these springtime highs that we're seeing across the middle of the country. That is where our temperatures are not so much feeling like February, but instead maybe March. We've got temperatures headed to the upper 60s in Little Rock today. Nashville will head to 63 degrees. Jackson and Dallas both making it into the low 70s by later this afternoon. And even as far north as St. Louis, and Omaha will be flirting with those low 60s to mid 50s. So overall, a spring-like feel in the air today. Not quite as warm as what it was yesterday, but still sitting above normal. And that's the story for tomorrow, too, especially as you look from the northern plains down to the southern plains. We'll see some colder air start to filter into parts of the Midwest, so it won't be quite as balmy for this time of year across that region. But places like Kansas City still set to hit 60 degrees. We'll see Tulsa, Amarillo, Dallas all into the 70s once more. Places like Rapid City, Denver, you're going to be into the low 60s. So the spring-like feel will continue into your Saturday, too. Meanwhile, as we look into early next week, notice the kind of temperature roller coaster ride that we're on. Places like Cleveland, remember I said we're going to see a bit of a cool down over the next couple of days across the Midwest, the Great Lakes. We end up into the 40s in, on Sunday in Cleveland. We are back to the low 50s, not bad by Monday, but we surge into the mid-60s by Tuesday. We are back to those spring-like temperatures before you know it. Similar story for Cincinnati going from the upper 50s Sunday to the low 70s by Tuesday. Chicago, you're going to top out at 66 degrees on Tuesday, but you, of course, will need those extra layers throughout the weekend before we see those temperatures warm up. 70s on tap Monday and Tuesday in Nashville. It'll be warm there for folks in the East Coast. We're not leaving you out of this either. Temperatures in New York end up into the mid-50s Tuesday, upper 60s for Washington, D.C., but again, we've got to take a couple of days to get there for folks across the East. Speaking of the East, we are waking up to a bit of rain from the Mid-Atlantic to the Northeast, even the Southeast saw some rain through the day today. Uh, we're going to start to see this system kind of work a little farther to the east. It means improvements will be made, but in the meantime, we're needing that rain gear from Boston to Hartford. We've got some snow falling in parts of New England, uh, mainly focused across portions of Maine. That's where we're going to continue to see some snow, but Vermont, New Hampshire, all included in that. Remember I said the system will work to the east? Well, that's exactly what happens by later today. It's offshore, and we're expecting most of the rain and the snow to go with it. Could see a couple of lingering showers hugging the coast, especially across portions of the South Atlantic. That's where we'll see even a potential for some strong storms this afternoon. One thing to note, downwind of the lakes, we'll still have that cold air coming off the, the water. So lake effect snow possible. That's going to hug right along the lake. So just one note there. Meanwhile, Saturday looks pretty good. Warm highs for the middle of the country. No surprise there. Sunny, dry out west. People are going to be thrilled with that as they continue to dry out in California. We will see some chilly conditions for folks across the Midwest and the Northeast. But remember, that's not going to last for long because those temperatures are on the rise here, even as we get into Sunday. Not the warmest that they'll be over the next seven days for the east, but they'll definitely be Im improving significantly. The middle of the country still dealing with records. Across Texas, we could see temperatures in the 80s, mid-80s at that. 
We'll see places into the northern plains in the 50s and 60s, so still dealing with the mild air uh, for our, our friends in the plains. Out west, staying dry once again on Sunday, but it's by the time we get into Monday, uh, Stephen, really late Sunday and then into Monday where we once again will have to track some rain for our friends out in California. The Pacific Northwest will see one storm happen on Sunday, but as we go Sunday into Monday is when that rain will start for folks uh, in California. That's where we'll, we'll have to watch for some additional rain. Not as much as we've received in the past couple of storms, but still significant. Of Those temperatures, though, is it spring? impressive? No, the groundhog was wrong. Wasn't well, oh, isn't he always? Wow. I mean, don't get me started on the groundhog. It's controversial. We, it's the 23rd of, of February. Really, meteorological spring starts on March 1st. Oh. So we're we're getting there. Okay. Still above normal, though. Feeling All like right. spring, definitely. I keep forgetting the month is almost over. I know. I don't know where the February. last two months went. Yeah, great point. <laughs> All right, Angie, thanks so much. Of course. We've got much more to come this hour of Morning News Now, including the old school tech that's now in high demand and selling for some big bucks. But first, the war in Ukraine. It's now been two years since Russia invaded, and the White House is unveiling a fresh batch of sanctions aimed at hundreds of targets in Russia. We've got a lot more on that coming up next. We're back now with the latest on the war in Ukraine, which tomorrow hits the two-year mark. And to mark that milestone this morning, the Biden administration announced a brand new package of Russian sanctions on more than 500 targets. The measures are also in response to the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has more from eastern Ukraine. It's been almost exactly two years since Russia invaded this country, and these are just some of the thousands of rockets and missiles Russia has fired at Ukraine and continues to fire as this country now finds itself in a difficult position as American support is becoming less reliable. While in Russia, officials say that Alexei Navalny died of natural causes. The mother of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has finally seen her son's body at a morgue near the Russian prison where he died. But she says authorities won't release his remains unless he's buried in secret. She posted her response for the world to see, saying, They are blackmailing me. They are setting conditions where, when, and how my son should be buried. That is illegal. Hundreds of Navalny supporters have been arrested for honoring his legacy. And it seems Russia doesn't want a Navalny funeral to become a rally, or worse, a protest against President Vladimir Putin, especially now while he's trying to show strength ahead of rubber stamp elections next month. He's been shown on Russian TV in trucks and in a modernized version of a Cold War long-range nuclear bomber touting it as easier to control and very reliable. The U.S. is expected to announce new sanctions against Russia today, but Putin appears unconcerned. His main priority, conquering Ukraine, is finally making progress as promised American aid and weapons are held up by Congress. Ukrainian President Zelensky overnight again making a case for more aid. Will Ukrainians survive without Congress support, of course, but not all of us. We went to the front, driving to the town of Chazivyar, where Russian troops are closing in. Without American weapons, the town could be the next to fall. And this is the town hall that was destroyed by Russian strikes. And on the wall, Ukrainian troops have left a message. We are not asking for too much. We just need artillery shells and aviation. The rest we do ourselves. The acting mayor, Serhii Chaus, says with the town in ruins, nearly everyone has left. Are people angry with the United States? We just don't understand how someone can say that we are your support, you can count on our shoulder, and at the very same moment, we don't feel this shoulder of support, he says. After the loss of Avdivka, are Russian troops heading this way, heading for your town? He says, I think they are. 100 percent. A delegation of five Democratic senators led by Chuck Schumer is in Ukraine today in a renewed effort to get aid flowing to this country. 
All right, Richard Engel, thanks so much. And for more on this, let's bring in Kira Rudik. She's a member of the Ukrainian parliament. Kira, thanks so much for being here. And as Richard was just mentioning, Russian forces have been making gains on the battlefield, most notably capturing the city of Divka. What is the feeling inside Ukraine right now as we get close to that two-year mark? Hello, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. Well, our strategy, our aim, and our goal did not change a bit. We are here, we are going to fight, we plan to survive and to win the war. And if you divide the efforts into us fighting and having the soldiers on the ground and our allies providing the weapons and the support, we keep doing our part. But we see significant delay in getting the ammunition from uh, our um, European allies and uh, this delay uh, from uh, the United States is absolutely terrifying. And it already cost us lives of people and will continue costing more and more. It, you know, the time, it feels really different when you are in the trenches or you are under the bombarding in a peaceful city and when you are in the Congress or just living in a peaceful country. This is why we keep urging all our colleagues, everybody that we know, uh, to make the decision. And when we were talking to our fighters, and I can tell you, it's incredibly hard, almost impossible to explain to people who are fighting at the front what is the delay about. They mm -hmm. wanted to share only one thing, that for as long as it takes time is now. An important update we had from Ukraine. All right, international headlines now, starting with a deadly fire in eastern Spain. Our Claudio Lavanga joins us now with more from Rome. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning, that's right. At least four people have died and several others have gone missing or are still missing after a huge fire engulfed at least two apartment blocks in Valencia. Now, the fire started at a 14-story block before spreading to another building next to it. According to the Spanish newspaper El País, the main building contained 138 flats and was home to 450 residents. More than 20 fire crews tackled the blaze overnight, saving residents with the help of cranes. Experts told local media they believe the highly flammable cladding on the building enabled the fire to spread quickly. Let's go now to Sydney in Australia where Taylor Swift fans were temporarily evacuated from a stadium an hour before the start of the concert as a precaution after a huge storm hit the area. Accor Stadium said on its X account the start time had been delayed and asked fans in the venue to stay undercover until further notice. The prediction of severe storm also caused flight delays and cancellations, but Qantas put on a special Airbus A380 from Melbourne to make sure fans from there made it to Sydney on time. Eventually, Swift took the stage to a huge roar. And let's end the story of the world in Portugal, where a dog who last year was named as the oldest in the world by the Guinness World Records was stripped of his title after doubts over evidence of his age. Bobby, this is the name of the dog, of course, died last October at the reported age of 31 years and 165 days. But recently, the Guinness World Records launched an investigation and said the microchip claimed to prove Bobby's age was not sufficient proof to grant him the title and that there is no conclusive evidence which can definitely prove is the date of birth. Back to you. Wow, justice for Bobby. That is an upsetting story. All right, Claudio, <laughs> unexpected. Thanks so much. Right. Well, coming up, a damning day in court for rust armorer Hannah Gutierrez Reed. We'll bring you the latest from inside the courtroom with the prosecution's searing opening statement and how her defense team is responding. That's next on Morning News Now. We're back now with a look at the involuntary manslaughter trial of Rust Armorer Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Opening statements got underway yesterday, and during them, prosecutors described the weapons supervisor's work on set as sloppy, telling the jury she was responsible for the bullet that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. NBC News entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas joins us now with the latest on this. Chloe, good morning. Good morning. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed showed little emotion in court as prosecutor Jason Lewis called her irresponsible on the set of the film set, saying that she should have checked the gun more than once. But her attorneys say that the blame should be placed on actor Alec Baldwin. These witnesses are going to describe the defendant's conduct as unprofessional and sloppy. 
Harsh words from New Mexico prosecutor Jason Lewis against Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the armorer on the 2021 Rust set charged with involuntary manslaughter and tampering with evidence. The prospect of live ammunition landing up on a film set is incomprehensible. It's something that should never happen. Prosecutors telling the jury in opening statements they will prove Gutierrez-Reed routinely left guns and ammunition around unattended. The evidence will show that the defendant treated the safety protocols as if they were optional rather than if people's lives counted on her doing her job correctly. According to prosecutors, six rounds of live ammunition were found on set, even showing a photograph of a gun holster worn by the film star Alec Baldwin that they claim held a real bullet and that Gutierrez Reed brought them from the home of her father, also a well-known Hollywood armorer. The defense arguing Baldwin, who was one of the film's producers, bears more responsibility than the 24-year-old armorer. Alec Baldwin pointed a gun on that set. You will hear that Hollywood actors are not allowed to point guns, real guns, at other actors or crew. Baldwin has denied any wrongdoing. More than simply pointing the finger at other people in the production chain of command, the defense also has to humanize the defendant and also show that she was a kind of victim herself. Gutierrez Reed's attorney also slamming the film's production company for hiring her for two jobs, the armorer and props assistant, even citing an email she had sent her manager during filming. She said in this email, when I'm not able to focus on my armorer duties, this is when mistakes happen. Mistakes prosecutors believe Gutierrez Reed admitted in her own words. The statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting, she says at the end, I just, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. We asked the production company for comment on the accusations that Hannah Gutierrez Reed was overwhelmed with her responsibilities on the set and they haven't gotten back to us, but they did agree to settle a workplace safety case for $100,000 without admitting any wrongdoing. NBC News has also reached out to Baldwin's legal team for comment. He has pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter and faces his own criminal trial this summer. Baldwin's legal team will be watching this very closely because legal experts say this case is basically a roadmap for what he'll potentially face during his trial over the summer. A lot of eyes on this one and a lot of eyes on that one. Chloe, thank you so much. Well, the hottest time of the year to buy a house is just around the corner. And newly released data shows that even while houses are getting more expensive, home sales are on the rise as well. So whether you're buying or selling, we're taking a look at what you need to know to get the best deal. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans joins us now with all the answers. So, Christine, thanks for being here. Morning. So, what is the latest on the housing market? It's hard to keep up with yeah. the latest. Well, I would say we're hoping for a thaw this spring because last year really was a deep freeze, Stephen. You had home sales in this country the lowest since two, or 1995. So, think of oh, that. I mean, that's yeah. a long time ago. So, it was just a deep freeze. The couple of years before that, it was just a... It was just like a frenzy. You know, people had hundreds of people lined up for, for open houses and houses were going for cash and way above offer. I think it's going to be a little more normal this mm -hmm. year. Home price is still rising. And that's because inventory is still not exactly where it needs to be. But I think, and I, and I just heard from a real estate agent this morning who texted me and said, look, I have more inventory for sale this year than I've had in a couple of years. That's a good thing. Yeah, I know a lot of people that made some great money on sales yeah. over the past the few sellers, years. The sellers, the sellers. The sellers, what about, are we looking at a, a, a continued seller's market now? It is still a seller's mm -hmm. market, but less of one. And I'll tell you one thing, Zillow said that one in five sellers are cutting their price. Mm. So that's good news for the home buyers. And you know, prices, homes are going a little faster early in the season than they have in, in recent months. And they seem to be priced a little better. So a well-priced home is moving. A price a overpriced home is not. So that's mm. showing that we're getting a little bit back in balance, I think. Yeah, that's some good news there, yeah. finally. Well, unfortunately for home buyers, mortgage rates have been on the rise. The national yeah. average for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, about 7.3%. So uh, how does that affect people? So look, mortgage rates, a lot of people had hoped that early this year they'd start to drift lower. They just haven't. Mm. So you can expect a gradual decline maybe later in the year, but I wouldn't bet on 3 to 4% interest rates anytime soon. So that means if you're in the market to buy a home because you need to move for a school district, you need to mm -hmm. move for a job, you need to move for the normal reasons you, you buy a home, 
you're going to have to overlook that higher mortgage uh, rate. It might be that you're going to be able to afford less of a house with those higher mortgage rates, and you can refinance down the line, but got to do the math because you mm. pay closing costs again when you refinance, so that's expensive too. I think the days of the 3 and 4% mortgage are well behind us. Wow. Maybe you can hope for something below 7 or 6% later this year. No, but you're certainly right. Some people can't wait. They have to move now. Right. So options are few. All right, Christine, nice to see a great you. breakdown. Thanks yep. so much. Well, coming up, uh, head over heels. Could wearing heels actually be good for you? We've got some new research after the break that's pointing to both function and fashion. That's coming up next. Stay with us. We're back now with some financial headlines, and it looks like Reddit is heading to Wall Street. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us now with more on this. Good morning, Savannah. Hey, Stephen. Good morning. Yeah, you got that right. Reddit files for its long-awaited initial public offering, which could come as soon as next month on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, this would be the first social media IPO since Pinterest went public in 2019. Reddit, which was founded in 2005, is one of the most visited websites with more than 100,000 communities and 73 million average daily active visitors. Reddit says its non-employee moderators or Redditors will be able to take part in the IPO. Now, if you were looking to book a trip on the world's longest direct flight, well, you're going to have to wait just a bit longer. Kansas says manufacturing delays have impacted delivery dates for the Airbus jets that will be used on the ultra long haul flights until 2026. Now, the more than 19 hour flight will connect Australia with New York and London. The inaugural flights were scheduled to start late next year. And Beyonce officially launched her hair care line called Sacred this week. In an interview with Essence, the superstar says the business is completely self-funded with no investors or outside backing. Allure recently reported the products could have gone to market sooner, but the six-year development process took that long because of extensive testing. As of last year, data shows black women received just 1% of venture capital funding, Stephen. Wow, and Beyonce is now a country star. What I mean, can she do? She, what can she do? I know, impressive. Also impressive, our Silvana Hanau. Thanks so much for that. <laughs> Thanks, David. All right, now to a story that has a lot of people talking. High heels have a reputation for being uncomfortable and difficult to walk in, but a new study out from the University of Texas is saying that people who wear heels frequently can actually become more efficient walkers. Well, joining me now to discuss whether we've been unfairly slandering heels for a long time, board certified podiatrist and foot and ankle surgeon, Central Park Soul, here in New York. We have Dr. Brad Schaefer and, of course, meteorologist Angie Lassman, because she is famous for wearing heels. Always. Along with forecasting the weather, yeah. science and fashion, you can do it all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Angie, why don't you kick us off since you're the heel expert? Yeah, so I, I read this headline, I read the, the, you know, the research that we're seeing here. What do you think of the study? Can it possibly be true that wearing heels is good for us? And what makes us an efficient walker as well? Sure, I think uh, it's twofold. Like everything in moderation, is fine. I mean, literally everything. As far as like wearing heels like this every single day, they're going to do more harm than good. Yeah. They just naturally are. I think the study is actually showing that, you know, it will give you a tighter heel cord, tighter Achilles, and kind of give you a good propulsion every step that you take. More explosive uh, action, jump higher, oh. run faster, things like that. But you're going to pop an Achilles, you're going to strain a calf, <laughs> you're going to have more harm than good. So I would not recommend this at all. The, wow. the cons yeah. outweigh the pros. It's yeah, for like sure. There. And sorry to uh, Regina, director, whose <laughs> shoes we've borrowed for this. Yeah, segment. they're beautiful. <laughs> Hate to break it to you. Yes, they do. They do look great. And I have a question. Uh, it, it sounds off topic, but the Barbie movie. Yes. Um, the famous scene now where her feet are like stuck in this position and then they go flat. Obviously, that is a joke, but could something similar happen with extended heel wear? What are the downsides of these shoes? Sure. So you wear heels all the time like that. You are going to be stuck in that position as you see this scene right here. Oof. Getting back to a flat foot, it's going to take years of PT, years of stretching, just to get that calf and Achilles structure back down to where it should be. You need to support your feet. You can support your feet with regular shoes, insoles in your 
shoes are super important, and it's really just to keep you in a neutral position. When you're in high heels like that, you're not in a neutral position. It has a cascading effect from the knees, the hips, the lower back. Mm. You have to support those puppies. So here's my question. I mean, I, I work on television. I wear, I'm sure, just like our viewers, heels almost every day. Yeah. What can we do to make it so that it's not so painful? What are some things, some steps that we can take? You mentioned insoles, but I mean, yeah. can I put an insole in my stiletto? <laughs> what mm. what yeah, do I for, do? Help for, me. Absolutely, for sure. You can go anywhere from like Dr. Scholl's insoles to your sneakers, uh, to high heel shoes. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of companies out there that have just gel that you can put in just to kind okay. of soften that blow. Like, where do you have pain when you wear your high heels? I mean, if I'm wearing them prolonged periods in the toe box, yes. or sometimes it's the arch of my foot. It yeah. just depends on the heel, really. So a lot is like ball of the foot from what I hear. Okay. So that can create just inflammation in the ball. It can create an aromas, which is inflamed nerves, inflamed joints, which is called metatarsalgia. I mean, these things hurt. And most of the time, it's ball of the foot. Are there, like, exercises and stuff you could do? I mean... Yeah. A lacrosse ball on the edge yeah, of my foot or what? Yeah, what <laughs> you see you my do? desperation? Yeah, desperate, sure. yeah. Listen, I'm not going to ever say to not wear high heels. Right. Like, look as fashionable as you can. But, like, maybe wear sneakers to the job and then wear your high heels while yes, walking around that. here. Like, all of these things are important. Right. Again, I hate to say it, but everything in moderation. It is true. Whether we're working out, whether we're acti activity-wise, high heel-wise, it's all moderation. Right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I'm fascinated, though. You talked about some of the benefits of wearing heels. Uh, men wear heels of two course. Uh, sh could we see uh, athletes uh, wearing heels for those those benefits, the, the extra ups? Yeah. So that is the only thing about the article where I was like, mm, maybe. Maybe. Because, yeah, if you, if you are a toe walker, um, you do have a little more bounce to your step. Oh. That's kind of what, like, the article was saying. Like, the more you tighten that structure, it does propel you forward a little bit. Again, that's not a positive. It's just that is what will happen. You get a tight structure, you kind of will have a little more hops. It's just kind of natural. I don't recommend any of this. <laughs> but, yeah, you, you tighten that structure, you probably will have a little more bounce. Sounds like you could yeah. just do a couple of calf raises every, you know, right. like yeah. instead of wearing heels. You, you strengthen it properly right. and then you're really going to uh, excel. But um, this is just a little cheat that I don't <laughs> recommend. <laughs> wow, uh, fascinating. Yeah. So glad we talked to you, Dr. Sure, thank you. Thanks and so much. Angie as well. She needed that advice. Clearly. I did. All right, we appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, you're well, right. there's been a, a rise recently in the popularity of old school technology. Now, I'm talking about that flip phone my dad still has and the iPod. Remember those? Even Walkmans are becoming trendy again, and it is creating a high demand for these devices. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more on the return of vintage tech. At the time, the name was genius, the Walkman. Music in hand and on the move. Put on a Walkman and see the world in a whole new light. It was a revolution. Roughly 40 years later, the name hasn't aged so well, but the devices themselves are definitely having a moment. The Sony Walkman, including the beloved yellow sports model, can fetch hundreds of dollars on eBay. And if the so-called portable music player is in the original box, the price jumps into the thousands. It isn't just the Walkman either. Old devices of all kinds are being scooped up in an increasingly online world. From record players and VHS machines to film cameras and video game consoles. All things offline are starting to look pretty good again. I have, I have some cool stuff. For the last six years, Ron Leckler uh, has been collecting VHS yeah, players and old like TVs. The, the I also have uh, this little solid state TV is a Sony solid state from 1967. He's got 14 of them. I just feel like there's a joylessness to digital media. You can't really, like, hold it in your hands the way that you used to. According to Google, old-school technology has seen a rise in search trends. iPod, a thousand songs in your pocket. Searches are up 5,000% for the iPod Classic. Point-and-shoot cameras reached a five-year high. And retro game console searches are up 350%. What's it called? It's called the Game Boy. With a demand for handheld games like the Game Boy from 1989. And this relic console, the Atari 2600. The new video computer system by Atari. You died there. At a game store in Manhattan, they have an old Atari in stock. For now. 
The manager tells me the vintage games go fast. So a genuinely brand new system is honestly worth a lot. Look at this. This 1989 Game Boy called out to me. Turns out Tetris is a bit like riding a bike. Oh, yeah, two rows. No need for Wi-Fi. The game wasn't downloaded and no charger. Yeah. Just a few trusty double A's. And batteries takes batteries. Tetris, I'm jealous. Stephanie, thanks so much. Well, coming up, it's the latest and greatest in the world of entertainment. It is your can't-miss list. It is on deck. And this weekend marks the release of a reimagined live-action cult classic on Netflix. But does Avatar The Last Airbender actually live up to the hype? The reviews are in. We've got Darren Karp with us when we come back. It's time for our weekly can't miss list. All the movies and shows you need to see this weekend from a space thriller for anyone excited about yesterday's moon landing to a live action Avatar series, which is of course dividing fans. And joining me now on set to talk about all this that we can't miss this weekend is Bravo personality and host of the Shaken and Disturbed Podcast? So podcast. Uh, my, my Revolutionary well, podcast. Podcast, the term, just left my brain for a second. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Darren Karp, of course. Thanks so much for being here. So first, let's talk about Drive Away Dolls, this thriller from the Coen brothers. Uh, how's this one looking? Yeah, th this is actually going to be pretty good by Ethan Coen. So this is kind of reminds me of Bottoms, if you saw it from 2023, ah. which was one of my favorite films last yeah. year. Uh, mixed with Thelma and Louise, okay? Wow. Two friends kind of at a existential crisis they decide to road trip to tallahassee together so as all, one does as one as you and i will right do course. after this listening to my <laughs> podcast uh and they kind of encounter some inept criminals along the way so it's pretty funny it's pretty witty it's a little dangerous they open up a briefcase the combination is zero 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 we, we leave it on we don't know what's uh what's there but it's in cinema <laughs> now it's pretty funny matt damon makes it a couple appearances but uh, it's rated r so i don't necessarily um encourage you to go with your hmm. family okay. Okay. Beanie Feldstein is also in this as a star-studded cast, but it is pretty good. Yeah, quite the cast. Yes, quite the cast. All right, don't want to miss that one. This one sounds pretty different, though. Uh, a po the Power of Faith and Family talked about here in Ordinary Angels, starring Hilary Sw Swank as a small-town ha hairdresser. What's mm. this one about? Okay, in full disclosure... I will watch anything Hillary Swank and like mm. Jodie Foster pull out. So totally. Hillary Swank is in, you know, just some of the best Ordinary Angels. It has gotten mixed reviews, I will say, about the movie, but Hilary Swank has not gotten mixed reviews. Her performance in this is pretty incredible. Yes, yeah, she plays this small-town hairdresser who's kind of down on her luck. She doesn't know what to do until she meets until she meets potentially the love of her life, Ed. Oh. And he's got two daughters. One is unfortunately in desperate need of a liver transplant, which, as we know, is pretty impossible to get. She's a young girl. So Hillary Swing's character, Sharon, kind of makes it her lot in life to help this family. And through faith, through miracles, mm. uh, she really puts her life on the line for this family. And it's kind of a beautiful message if... If, you know. Okay, if you want to cry. If this you want to cry. the one you go to. Hillary yes. Swing's incredible acting. And Highly that recommend. story... Mm, hard to beat. Yeah. Um, except maybe with this one for anime fans. Anime fans will like this one. Demon Slayer, the movie out in theaters today after a long wait. And this has a major storyline that wasn't part of the TV series. What's this about? Yeah, okay, so this is a Japanese manga series. For those, you know, that usually isn't my beat. That usually isn't <laughs> what I like, okay? Very I'm far from Bravo. Very far from Bravo. I'm not really into anime or Japanese manga, but... I am in the minority, I think, with people mm. here. So this is Demon Slayer, uh, Kimetsu no Yaba. This is actually directed by Hiro Sotozaki. So the animation is beautiful. When I was watching some of this, I mean, it really is mesmerizing. You can kind of see all the colors kind of come to life. But yeah, this is returning to the big screen in sort of a different way. This is actually going to be two episodes back to back. And one of the episodes mm. the audience has never seen before. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack. It's about two hours. So just a lot of story to uncover. I don't want to go into all the details. If you're not into it, it will definitely not be. <laughs> Be your, not be your flavor, but yeah. it is beautiful, and I love the drawing. The animation is just top-notch, in my yeah. opinion. Wow, gorgeous. Yeah. Okay, this one is a little controversial. The Last Airbender, now streaming on Netflix. I've seen some good reviews, and I've seen a lot of complaints. What do we know about this? I've seen 50-50 as well. Yeah. Okay, so some people are just ripping it apart. Now, obviously, with stuff like this, especially with when you have this live-action series that is already based on the previous Nickelodeon one, mm. 
it's easy to create something. It's hard to redo something. So yeah. people are going to have strong opinions. But I will say the positive reviews that I have read are pretty great. I mean, I think they, that Netflix really has taken this away from Nickelodeon, has made it its own thing. A lot of people are confused. They think it's James Cameron's avatar. And I, and I read a couple of things where some of the actors thought that they were auditioning for James Cameron's avatar. It is two Oops. different worlds. Two, yeah. Just same name, but two different worlds. In fact, this is actually even older than James Cameron's avatar. So it kind of, wow. it came first. Um, yeah. But the effects are pretty awesome. Yeah, I just, those effects, is the first time I've seen that. They do look pretty good. And all of the episodes are out on Netflix, so you can binge it and decide for yourself. Binge it and then go online, complain, praise it, whatever you want to do. <laughs> yes, we do online. As yes. we do. Also want to talk about the out-of-this-world conspiracy theory-fueled thriller Constellation. It is streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. I'm very interested in this one. We just had another moon landing yesterday. Yes, we did. I love to hear about this. Yes. If you love space, honestly, anything sci-fi, this is for you. This actually stars Numi Rapace. Mm. Uh, this, she's, she's actually incredible. She plays Joe, this astronaut that has survived this catastrophic disaster in space. She survives it. Oh. She comes back to Earth and discovers that her life is a little out of place. Not everything is what it seems. Her daughter might not be her daughter. She has a piano in her house, but she's never played piano. Oh. She doesn't remember the piano being in her house. So it is very so. conspiracy theory driven. It's an eight episode series, but the first three parts are out on Apple TV+. Plus. I highly recommend this series. So. It's really good. I know that I'm going to be watching that. Great. All right, Darren Carp, thanks so much. Thank you all for watching. That's it for this hour morning news now, but your news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.